we, we start the afternoon session. I'm the chairman, Annalisa Fasolino. And the first talk, uh, we will try to keep the time because uh, we have to be ready at 7.30 with, for, for the bus. Um, so the first talk is Bo Person, um, heart particle adhesion and on the stability of spinning asteroids. Very original title. Okay, thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be back here. I was here the first time 1978, I think. Or was it 79 or 78? Yeah, you know. 79. Uh, 79, yeah, so very long time ago. <clears throat> Here you asked me to say a few words about Mark Robbins because I think I have interacted with him longer than anybody else here. And my initial, initial interaction was not particularly good. So it was around the beginning of the 90s. We were both interested in, in trying to understand the measurement of Jackie Krim. She did some quartz crystal measurements where she slide absorbed layers on metals. <clears throat> And Mark Robbins and company wrote a paper where they tried to explain this by the corrugation of the substrate exciting phonons or vibrations in the sliding layer. <clears throat> uh, I had a different background coming from having studied electronic friction. And uh, I knew that the lifetimes or slip times Jackie was measuring are very similar to what you can deduce from surface res resistivity measurements. So when Mark had written this paper here, I wrote a comment, which I tried to get published in Science 2, but it got rejected, but still it got Mark very upset for some years. Um, but as time goes on, we finally become friend, friends again, and we even have some common papers. So happy end, you may say, of this story. <clears throat> so I will tell you about some work very recent, I've done this year basically, on adhesion and heat transfer in asteroids. And the reason I did this is that one astrophysicist contacted me and uh, asked if I can help him to understand these problems. Uh, this has been studied already by astrophysicists for maybe 20 years, but they used very simple models, which really doesn't work for these applications. So I will tell you a little about first adhesion in, for elastically stiff particles with surface roughness, <clears throat> and applic application will be to stability of spinning asteroids. And, and then I will tell you about some experiment I did myself, about capillary adhesion, which tests some part of this theory. And then I will speak about heat transfer in small particle systems and application to asteroids again. <clears throat> so the asteroid belt was formed at the same time as our solar system, so it's very old, 4.6 billion years old. And the temperature in the asteroids is around 200 Kelvin, typically. And at this temperature and over this time period here, basically all molecules which are absorbed on the surface will get desorbed, will disappear, if the binding energy is below one electron volt or so. So these particles here are very clean. At least that's what I assume. So you cannot form any capillary bridges between them. And I will assume that there is just Van der Waals interaction between the fragments in these asteroids. <clears throat> and this is how an asteroid typically looks like. They are called um, rubble, rubble pile asteroids. They consist of many fragments. And the size of these can start at 10, 10 meter uh, lateral size down to micrometer. You can see this region here seems to be full of very small particles. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that these asteroids are rotating, and the rotation speed change with time because of photons absorbed from the sun. The photons have some momentum, and uh, that will change the rotation speed of the asteroid. Very slowly, of course, but on the time scale of 10 million years, they start to rotate so quick that they typically break up into pieces. <clears throat> which cannot be studied directly because it's 10 million, year, 10 million years between each such event. Uh, but uh, here is very interesting information about the rotation speed. Here is plotted a figure with, with a rotation period in hours. 
in the logarithmic scale as function of the diameter of the asteroid. And you can see that basically, all, at least all the bigger asteroids, no one rotate faster than 2.3 hours. That's the shortest uh, rotation period. And this is exactly what you get if you assume that only gravitational forces keep together the asteroid. So if you look at the particle on the surface of the asteroid here, uh, it, on, the, on it acts some forces, the centrifugal force, gravitational force, and maybe some adhesion to particles in the neighborhood of it. So at the point of just this particle being able to fly off, you must have this force equilibrium shown here. <clears throat> uh, and if you just put in, we know how the gravitational force looks like as a function of the radius of the particle, and we know how the centrif centrifugal force looks like. So if you just use this equation, you can show that the rotation um, angular velocity at break up is given by this equation here. So if you neglect adhesion, it depends only on the, on the gravitational constant and the mass density of this asteroid, which are known. And if you put in those quantities here, you get a period, 2.3 hours, just like you see experimentally. That means that this addition term here must be very small. And I'm going to show you that uh, when you have very rough particles, rough surface, the addition does not depend on the radius of the particle. And uh, the only way you can explain these results here is by assuming that the addition force between the particles is of order nano, nano newton. You assume that, then you can explain why no one is rotating faster here, and you can also explain why some small asteroids can rotate faster than these 2.3 hours. Because you have, if you take into account this addition term, which depends on one of the radius here, for small, for small radius this becomes important, and that can explain why you can see longer, lifetime, longer rotation, shorter rotation periods than 2.3 hours. So I will try to model the addition between uh, fragments of stone, of minerals. Um, and so the first thing we did is that we took a granite stone and we cracked it, and I measured the power spectrum of this granite particle, granite surface. And with my stylus instrument, I can only do that down to micrometer roughly. So this region you see here is the power spectrum of a granite surface. He has plotted the logarithm of power spectrum as a function of logarithm of wave number. So 10 to the 6 here corresponds to roughly uh, micrometer roughness. Uh, but the particle which I can simulate on a computer are much smaller than this. So I assume that the power spectrum can be extrapolated, like indicated here. Uh, and then I do calculation for particles with different sizes. And uh, the shortest roughness I include is of order nanometer. And, uh, uh, and then, depending on the size of the particle, oh, I'd, maybe I can do something here. No. Do I need to close it and start again, or what do I need to do? I need to put in that number again. Yeah, okay, moment. Moment, I have to. I don't like these stupid systems. Zero, eight, three, seven, one, three. Can join without the video. It will save. Okay, moment. I need to find. Oh, here. I cannot see it. I have to.
Fine, like... Okay, good. Uh, up. I think I finished that page. Yeah, so I'm looking at uh, particles with different sizes, and the longest wavelength roughness I, I can include in the calculation is determined by the lateral size of the particle. So when I look at uh, particles with, with increasing radius, I need to move this cutoff to longer wavelengths or shorter wave number. And I generate random rough surfaces by adding uh, plane waves, basically, with random faces and uh, a weight which depends on this power spectrum. And here I show you one figure. This is a randomly rough surface which I generated, and now I add it on top of a spherical particle. And I consider two different cases. Uh, one, when I have Van der Waals interaction in between, and I assume there is an adhesive pressure which scales like one over the distance to the three. And the other case I will study is with capillar bridges. So then I have liquid in some region at the interface. And I get negative pressure because I assume this liquid will wet the surfaces. So when I do these simulations, uh, I get a different addition force for every particle because every particle has a different radius, uh, different roughness. So for each particle, I do average over 60 different realizations of this roughness. And this figure here shows the cumulative probability to find some particular adhesion force uh, for Van der Waals interaction and for capillary bridges. You can see for Van der Waals interaction, it's of order nanometer or little less, and then uh, nanonewton or little less. And for uh, capillary bridges, you get about 100 times bigger adhesion. Uh, this figure down here shows the adhesion force as a function of the radius of the particle on a logarithmic scale. Uh, if you have perfectly smooth particle, that's indicated by zero here, uh, no roughness at all, then uh, you can apply JKR theory or DM, DMT theory, and you expect a linear dependence of the force on the radius of the particle, and that's this line here. It has slope one on this logarithmic scale. Uh, and if I take granite, which is indicated by one here, I get an addition force which is independent of the particle size. So one nanometer particle will give you the same, or the addition between two nanoparticles is the same as between two blocks which have 10, 10 meters uh, diameter. And these numbers here is when I scale the roughness on the granite particle. So here I make it smaller and smaller. Here it's only one tenth in amplitude compared to the real one. And you can see how you approach this uh, linear scaling when you reduce the roughness. But really, for roughness on mineral particles, you are down here, so you expect no dependence on the radius of the particle. We studied uh, the same for capillary bridges, and you see basically the same thing. Uh, the force is independent of the radius of the particle as long as uh, you have enough roughness. And when the roughness goes to zero, a smooth particle, then you have again a linear radius dependence. This figure only illustrates the stress which acts between the particle and the substrate, which in this case was a flat, flat surface. Uh, this is for capillary bridges, and this is when you have uh, Van der Waals interaction. And here is distance 9 nanometers. You can see you have a very small contact region, and the local stress is not particularly high. It gets 150 uh, megapascal here, and this material which I'm using corresponds to, to silica, and there you need five gigapascal in order to plastically deform the material. So you have only elastic deformation in this application. And the same is true when you have capillary bridges. And here shows the elastic deformations which you will have when this particle is lying on the surface and only interact with this adhesion. Um, and you can see the biggest displacement when you have Van der Waals interaction is only about 0.01 nanometer, so 0.1 angstrom, uh, very, very small. 
Now, capillary bridges you get a little more, but still, uh, still very small. And that's because the addition force is very weak. So I give, for asteroids, we have only indi indirect test of this theory. Uh, but I also did some test of the theory for capillary bridges. Um, and this I did myself. I crunched some granite stone in this mortar here. I put the powder on a glass plate contained in this box here. And I changed the humidity in this box by having either a glass of water or salt absorbing, uh, uh, humidity absorbing salt. Uh, and uh, then I keep it inside for 24 hours. I take out the glass plate, turn it up and down and all the particles which are more heavy than the adhesion force will fall off. Uh, so the biggest particle remaining will be those where adhesion force is exactly the same as the gravitational force. And by knowing the size of the particle, which I can find using optical microscopy, I can estimate the gravitational force and therefore also the adhesion force. And when I have small humidity, uh, like this case here, about about 20% humidity, relative humidity, then the biggest particles absorbed are very small, of order 100, uh, 100 micrometer. And when I increase the, the humidity, bigger and bigger particles can keep attached. And finally, when I reach very high humidity, no particle falls off. And this happened to be the biggest particle on the surface. So here I plotted the logarithm of the adhesion force a function of the relative humidity obtained from these kind of measurements. The red line is what I calculate theoretically, and the green data port, uh, plots, points, uh, are for measurement of the type I just showed you. When I have many symbols, that means I have looked at many, many of the biggest particles on the surface. There are many similar big particles, and so that's why I got these statistics. And one interesting uh, thing here is that, that the theory is calculated for particles uh, with a diameter of about five micrometer, but the experiment is involving particles about 100 times bigger. So this also illustrates that the adhesion force is independent of the size of the particle, as I already told you. <clears throat> so my second part will be about heat transfer in asteroids, which is maybe the most important method used to study some properties of the asteroid is by looking at heat radiation. So this is one asteroid look, when you look in optical, micro, uh, optical telescope, and uh, this is when you lo look at the heat radiation coming from it. And you can see the temperature goes up to almost 300 Kelvin, the highest temperature. Uh, and uh, when you want to study this theoretically, you need to know the heat conductivity of this material uh, if the heat conductivity is very high, then the temperature has, temperature, surface temperature will be lower. The temperature will go deeper into the, diffuse deeper into the material. Uh, I mean, this asteroid is rotating, so this hot region will, after a few hours, be on the backside where it is very cold. So the temperature you measure experimentally will depend on the heat, heat conductivity. And when you analyze data like this, you need a heat conductivity which is about 100 times smaller than using the bulk material uh, which you have here. And the reason for that is that the heat, the, the thing which reduces the heat transfer is a contact. So heat diffuses very quick inside each particle. So each particle has an internal temperature which is more or less constant. It's the same everywhere. But different particles have different temperature. And there is a heat re resistance at the interface. <clears throat> And when you don't have capillary bridges and when you have no gas in the uh, surrounding the particles, the only way the heat can go from one, block, from one particle to another is via the area of real contact or via the electromagnetic field, which you have in the non-contact gap. And I will show you that this electromagnetic field is actually the most important one. And uh, people speak about the heat conductance, which is uh, heat conductance times the temperature difference gives you the energy flow per unit time from one, uh, one particle to the other particle. So I will focus on this, uh, on this uh, heat conductance because from that you can calculate the heat conductivity. 
and uh, the contribution from IRL contact, I claim, is very, very small. And the reason is that you have very weak interaction between these particles. Um, and when you have very weak interaction, uh, you can calculate the heat conductivity, heat conductance using this equation here, Boltzmann's equation times uh, like a friction coefficient here, which I call eta. And this friction coefficient is given by spring constant. There is some interaction potential between the two surfaces here. And if you expand that to second order around the equilibrium position, you get an effective uh, spring constant. And that's what, is, that's what is K is here. And rho is just the mass density. M is the mass of an atom, or in this case, maybe silicon dioxide group. And C is the sound velocity. And if you apply this equation, you get very small heat transfer, like 10 to minus 12 watt per Kelvin for this heat conductance. And that's about two order magnitude smaller than I will show you coming from the electromagnetic field. <clears throat> and the electromagnetic field can, depending on separation between two surfaces, you can have two different contributions. One is just radiation of photons, uh, gives a very well-known expression for the heat, uh, heat uh, current, which depends to the temperature to the four uh, on this solid and on that solid. But if the surfaces are very close to each other, you have also uh, evanescent electromagnetic field. And this contribution at short separation becomes much more important than the radiative contribution. And the way you understand this, radio, this decaying contribution is by uh, that something like that exists. If you look at the wave equation, and if you put in a plane wave like this, you solve it, you get this dispersion relation, and you can solve for the normal wave vector, wave number. And uh, it's given by this equation here. And so if the parallel wave number is larger than light velocity times frequency, then this becomes imaginary. And if you have a imaginary K set, you have a damped, uh, exponentially damped wave. And so that's this contribution. So if you look at the black body radiation uh, propagating photons, it's given by this very well-known relation here, depending only on light velocity, Planck's constant, and the Boltzmann constant. And uh, in my case, the temperature difference between two particles is very small. So we can expand this term to linear order in the temperature difference between the two particles. Uh, and that gives you this expression for the heat conductance, where A0 is some cross-section area of the particles, of the one of the particles. <clears throat> uh, the contribution from evanescent waves is a little more complicated. It depends on the reflection factor for electromagnetic waves against these surfaces. Uh, and here enters the distance. Here's an integral over wave number. And uh, uh, this factor pi here depend on temperature, given by this expression here. And this is reflection factor. So I calculated this uh, expression for silica. Silica has two strong optical phonons. And you need optical phonons to get infrared activity to the material. So here's plotted the minor part of the dielectric function, the function of frequency. Uh, so here is one high frequency optical phonon, here is one lower frequency optical phonon. And if I use um, this dielectric function, I can calculate this uh, conductance, thermal conductance, is given by a function of temperature divided by the separation to the square. And this function of temperature looks like shown in this figure here. So if you would put in nanometer separation here, you would get this factor would give you 10 to the 10 to the 18. Uh, so you have to multiply 10 to the 18 with 10 to the minus 13. You get something much bigger than the, uh, the black border radiation I told you about before. So now I took, now you, of course, when you have these particles, you don't have a constant separation, but the separation varies over the surface of the particle. So I have just averaged this expression again over the different separations which you have in different regions of the particle. And here is plotted the cumulant probability again, but now for this heat conductance. 
And in this case, there is some radius dependence. It's, it's relatively weak, but still there is some radius dependence. That comes because this heat conductance depends slower on the separation than van der Waals interaction. Van der Waals interaction give, was going like one over distance to the cube, but this goes like one over distance to the square. And that means that region farther away from the contact region will matter for uh, the heat conductance. And you can also see it here. I has plotted the logarithm of the heat conductance, the functional logarithm of the radius. And uh, this is what you get for uh, silica, or actually granite, granite particles, when you have one here. This is the result you would get if you have perfectly smooth particles. And this line here shows the black border radiation given by this initial equation I showed. St Stefan Boltzmann, uh, I think it's called Stefan Boltzmann's uh, radiation law. So you can see up to at least 10 micrometer, uh, the near field decaying uh, electromagnetic wave is, is more important than the, uh, than the black border radiation. <clears throat> We also studied this as a function of the fractal dimension, but I will not go into that. <clears throat> this is my last view graph. Uh, this project is still ongoing, so it's not really finished. Uh, but one can show that this heat conductivity, which I told you about in the beginning, uh, is given by this heat conductance divided by the radius of the particle times a numerical factor of order unity. And uh, if you look at the black border radiation, uh, it depends on the the gear depends as the square of the radius because it depends on the area. The photons doesn't decay, so it doesn't matter what separation it is. You get this out of the square dependence. If you look at the contribution from the non-radiative evanescent waves, it depends very weakly on the radius. I already told you that. And the contribution from the area of real contact does not depend on the radius of particle at all. Uh, and uh, we are using these results now in equations like this to try to understand the heat, uh, the heat uh, conductivity of asteroids. The problem is that asteroids doesn't consist of particles with one radius. They have a distribution of radius starting at, I told you, 10 meters down to micrometer probably. And so we need to develop some theory which can take into account this distribution of particle sizes. Maybe a kind of effective, effective medium theory to handle uh, that. Okay. So, the paper is open for questions. Mm. Here we have one. Is me? Uh, just maybe a naive question, but you talk about heat transfer, but that heat have everything equilibrium with the vacuum that is very cold. So how 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 that heat is being generated somewhere? <clears throat> the heat comes from the photons of the sun. Oh, okay, that's the heat source. The the asteroid is on the average in equilibrium, so the all the energy which gets get absorbed by the sun get emitted as heat radiation. You said this Van der Waals force is like nanonewton and it's independent of the radius. So, I mean, yes. so I take a block of granite of uh, one meter the diameter, it will have a nanonewton. Yeah. That's uh, surprising to me. <laughs> this is oh. basically because if you have a huge block, still the interaction is those cases. So what is happening out here doesn't contribute. Or it's okay. contributing in a negligible way. So everything which matters happens very close to the contact point. And that's why you get this result. But it can be that you have like not only one, maybe a few of these contacts. I mean, that it's, it's an order of magnitude, I guess, or something. Yes, else. but yeah. uh, uh, in principle you are right. Uh, in reality, probably there is three contact points like that, because at least if you have also some gravity, it cannot balance uh, okay. on top of one yes. sphere. So then probably you have tr three. Okay. So you have to multiply this force I calculate with a factor of three, probably, to get uh, more okay. accurate. Okay, that's but, amazing. Uh, otherwise, this is what comes out from uh, rigorous calculations. So 
uh, it is like it is. Heat conductivity would be much smaller if they were not rotating, because then you could, wouldn't have this exponentially decaying uh, channel. No, it has nothing to do with the rotation. Uh, because the, to, become the overall... to become an exponential, you needed to have a, a difference between the rotation Ah, you're, you're speaking about the first part of my, uh, uh, my presentation. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, the rotation speed of the whole asteroid is changing in time. Well, to, 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 yeah, it's to, changing to in time. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, it either speeds up or slows down because of absorption of photons. It depends on the shape. That uh, torque depends on the shape of the asteroid. So for a spherical asteroid, there would be no such effect. But no asteroid is perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly spheroid. spheroid. Okay. Okay, very interesting. I think people have to think a bit about that. So <laughs> you will get <clears throat> lots of questions at the. So I invite the second speaker.